what about those who have never heard the name of Jesus? Let me just put some questions on your mind to get you prepared to think through this. What is it that happens to people if they never hear the name of Christ or never know what he did for them? Are these people who have never heard about Christ doomed to face God's judgment simply because they never heard Jesus' name? Why would God allow one group of people, let's say people in America, just to be saturated with Christianity? You know, for every Starbucks you see, you pass 20 churches everywhere, while others have never even heard about them. Why would God do that? Do you see where we're coming from here? What happens to those people? Why did God allow this? And um, are people just doomed based on geographical accident? Well, here's my short, pithy answer. Number one, God hasn't revealed himself equally to all humans. I think that's indisputable. He has not revealed himself equally. But two, he has revealed himself enough to humans. And three, he will reveal himself extra to those who seek him. So just to make this real simple, and I've got this memorized, equal, (laughs) no, I don't, equal, enough, and extra. Equal, enough, and extra. It's a very simple way to remember how to respond to this objection. Now, that being said, that doesn't really say too much, but at least it helps you think through the answer. Let's begin with that first proposition. God hasn't revealed himself equally. To begin, is God required to bring equal revelation to every person? At first glance, you might say, well, yes, he should. Otherwise, that's not fair. That's not fair. People with a biblically trained mind should never say that. You should never appeal to fairness when approaching God. As soon as you appeal to fairness, you lose everything. Because if God was to be fair with you, we would all have a one-way ticket to hell. That's fair. That's just. That'd be perfectly just. The difficulty here is not fairness, whatever that means. The difficulty is that's not God's nature. God's nature is such that he loves all people, every man, woman, boy, and girl. God's nature is that he wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4, that God doesn't want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. So we don't appeal to God's fairness. We appeal to God's nature and goodness. This is what he says about his own heart. Now, I've heard them all. Maybe not, but let me give you a few. People have said, well, God can reveal himself equally to all people. Really? How? Well, he could etch John 3.16 on the moon. To which I would reply, in what language? English, of course. (laughs) Oh, English. Yeah, everyone speaks English. Uh, What about people that don't speak English? What about people that speak Spanish, Swahili? What about them? Well, 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 then he would have to write it in all the different languages. So now he's got to write it in all the different languages that have ever existed ever. Yeah, that would be equal. That would be perfectly equal. What about those who are nearsighted? What about those who are blind? What about those who can't read? Wouldn't be equal for them. And may I say, that's the majority of people throughout human history. Can't read. And nearsighted. (laughs) So that's not equal. I've heard, well, he could etch uh, a cross on every molecule. He could, uh, Carl Sagan saying that God could have a crucifix orbit the earth. Uh, Again, I don't think it's actually feasible for God to create a world of free persons where every person receives equal revelation of him. I don't think that's feasible for God to do. I didn't say I don't think it's logical. I think it's logically possible, but I don't think it's feasible. What do you mean? I think it's possible if God only created nine people that he could give equal revelation of himself. 
I think that's feasible. If there's only nine people that ever live in human history, those nine people could all be given the same information and those nine people could have the same equal amount of revelation. But I don't believe that's the kind of world God wanted to create where only nine people have the shot at salvation. I believe he wanted to create a world where anyone who wanted to know him could know him. And there's other overriding factors that don't make it feasible for God. While it's logically possible, I don't think it's feasible because there's all these other factors in play, like having billions of people, Revelation 7, an innumerable multitude from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people that come to worship the Lamb. God wants to see as many people come to faith as possible. What about that second proposition? God hasn't revealed himself equally, but I don't think that's feasible. I really don't. But he has revealed himself enough. He has revealed himself enough. What I'm going to say is definitely in the minority view among Bible-believing Christians. But I'm going to give my view. You're free to disagree with it. And then I'm going to give you a view that's like my view that's honestly not that different and actually might make you feel a little bit better. Okay? <laughs> Everyone got real silent. They're like, so a little bit of heresy is going to come here. All right. Bear with me here. Let me start with this. No one is forgiven apart from Christ, what Christ did on the cross, and the resurrection of Christ. No one will get into heaven based on their religion, their good works. Uh, as C.S. Lewis put it in, in The Last Battle, yeah, of course, that's fiction, but he was describing the people working and fighting for the other side might actually have been fighting for Aslan, but didn't realize it. So there could be people in other religions that actually, well, even though they're worshiping the wrong God, uh, in their heart, really, they're worshiping the true God. False. That is false. You don't have a word of that in the Bible. Repeatedly in the prophets, it's turn from Molech, turn from Baal, turn from Ashereth. That's not find the Christ part in Ashereth and try and make that uh, compatible with Christianity. None of that. It's turn from idols. Paul rips his cloak at Lystra in Acts 14 when they start to worship him as a god. We only and always are saved through the work and person of Jesus Christ, period. But do people need to hear his name? I get a check in the mail for a million dollars. I go and I instantly cash that check. But I don't know who gave me that check. Do I get the million dollars just out of the ether? No, somebody paid for that money to be sent to me. Somebody had great cost to themselves, gave me that money. I don't know who it was, but once I saw the check and realized what it was, I went and cashed that in. Could the same be true with regard to coming to faith even though you've never heard Jesus' name? I hold the view, yes. General revelation. Now, specific revelation refers to the Bible. Open up your Bible. It's specific. Specific revelation. I can read very clearly to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. Acts 4.12. Okay? That's what we need. We need that specific revelation. Specific revelation could also be specific in the sense that Jesus, in his incarnation, was specific revelation of God. He's, he's the perfect character of the Father, Hebrews 1. Well, that's specific, but what about general revelation? If you never had a Bible, is there general things that are revealed about God that you would know? Of course, of course, of course that's the case. Creation and conscience are there for all people that are rational, thoughtful people. Of course, little babies, this wouldn't apply to uh, people that are severely mentally handicapped, this wouldn't apply to. But as I've argued, and I'm going to argue, I believe that those people are taken to heaven if you don't have the rational faculty to understand language and uh, be able to understand how to receive Christ. I believe those people are taken directly to heaven. That being the case, for the rest of us, when we look out at creation, we see that requires a creator. It does, like I've argued before. If you saw a painting even if it was a bad painting, 
if you looked at that painting, you would say, what does this need? It needs a painter. You don't just have paintings without painters. What about morality? Inside, as Paul argues in Romans 1 and 2, we have a conscience that's alternately excusing and alternately uh, defending us. What does that mean? It means that when you're in eighth grade, you say, I'll never drink or smoke or do drugs. And then 10th grade, you say, well, I'll smoke cigarettes, of course, but I'm not going to drink or do drugs. And then 11th grade, you drink and smoke, and you say, well, I drink and smoke, but I'm not like one of those people that does drugs. And then by the time you're 19, you drink and smoke and do drugs and uh, beat up people on the street. And yeah, but I'm still not, not like one of those serial killers. You see what I mean? It, it alternately accuses or defends you. Wherever you're at, you're constantly feeling that sense of, I need to defend myself in what I'm doing, or I need to uh, excuse myself or uh, uh, attack other people. That's the whole self-righteous mindset that Paul describes in Romans 1 and 2. All of us have that conscience within, but then the question becomes, if I'm breaking a moral law, from whom did the moral law come? There is a moral law. Moral laws require moral lawgivers, therefore there is a moral lawgiver. Okay? You don't just have laws without lawgivers. If I went to the pharmacist and gave her a prescription, and she said, wait a minute, there's no signature. Who prescribed it? I said, nobody prescribed it. It's just a prescription. Would I get my medication? No. You need a prescriber. You need a lawgiver. If these are prescriptive things, then you need a prescriber. Same thing is true here. You can look out into the world and see that there is a creation that requires a creator and then you can look within yourself and say, there is a moral law written on my heart. From that, I believe you can have saving faith. What is faith according to the Bible? Hebrews 11:6 is the only definition. It says, without faith, you cannot please God. But to have faith, you need to believe that God is, or the NIV, God exists, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That is the only didactic definition of faith in the Bible. What is faith? Believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Or you need to believe that God is God and you need to believe that God is good. But in order to have saving faith, you need one more thing. You need to realize that you need forgiveness. So, let me give you a hypothetical. A man who's never heard about Christianity, lives in 800 AD, lives away from any Bibles, any Christians, but he's looking out at the stars and he sees all of the grandeur, Psalm 8, and he sees that knowledge is pouring forth day after day, Psalm 19. And he sees God's invisible attributes and divine nature, Romans 1.20. And then he thinks of the way that he treated his son earlier that day. He thinks, oh, I really regret doing that. I shouldn't have done that. He starts to think, who created all of this? And if I feel bad about how I treated my son, why do I feel bad? This wouldn't be a lot of deduction here. This would just be the common human condition. Why are we here? Who put this all here? And why am I guilty? You know, I've talked to so many people over the years, and I've asked them this question. What do you do with your guilt? The answer I have never heard, not from a single person, is what guilt? Everybody knows precisely what we're talking about when you ask, what do you do with your guilt? So that person could realize that there is a God that I fall short of what that God demands and I desperately need forgiveness. Whoever is above me and created all this and created me, I need forgiveness from that being. And that person could throw themselves on the mercy of God even though they don't know how God procured that forgiveness. They don't know that it was procured at an infinite cost through the person of Jesus. Some passages would be helpful. Luke chapter 11, or excuse me, Luke chapter 18, where you have the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee, he says, I, 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 I am thankful that I am not like them, and I pray twice a day, and I tie that I, I, I. It's all me, myself, and I. That's religion. But the tax collector, all he can say is, 
uh, beating his breast. He turns to God and won't even look at him. And he says, forgive me, a sinner. He doesn't say in Jesus' name. He doesn't say none of that. And Jesus says, that is the man, the one who said, forgive me, a sinner. That is the man who goes home, dikaio, justified, declared righteous. That man goes home, righteous. The Pharisee does not. Did he use Jesus' name? Does he know? Now, Jesus is using uh, an illustration, but it's illustrative of something. Of what? Of saving faith. Think of the thief on the cross. How much does he really pray? You know, the one guy is insulting Jesus, and he says, hey, shut up. You know, we're getting what we deserve. I need forgiveness, conscience. But he's not. He hasn't done anything wrong. Jesus is right. God is right. I'm wrong. I deserve judgment. We deserve to be on these crosses. That's what he's saying. And then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's it. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Very simple. Very simple. It's just, now the question is, could that happen for somebody who's never heard of Christ? Here's Don Richardson. He's a Christian missionary. This is from the book, Eternity in Their Hearts. He writes this of three different people groups. These are my notes. This is not directly from Richardson, but I couldn't quote everything. I just had to put it in my own words. So you're going to get the, the Spark Notes version, but I'm going to give you some examples of precisely what I just argued here. Ready? He refers to the Incas in South America, King Pachacuti, the king of the Incas from 1438 to 1471, openly questioned whether Inti, the sun god that traversed the sky, was truly God. That's what Pachacuti was wondering. And even went on to say, a divine being would not be hidden by clouds. That doesn't make any sense. Or follow the same path every day. What kind of a God is that? How could the God of the universe be blocked by clouds? And why would he follow the same route every day? That doesn't make much sense. Isn't he creative? Looks more like the things that we see in nature. So, Pachacuti said that we should lead a reform which changed Incan worship to Viracocha, the omnipotent creator of all things. Here's Richardson. He says, A God who created all things, Pachacuti concluded, deserves worship. And it would be inconsistent at the same time to worship part of his creation as if it were him. Within a century of his reign, however, Spanish conquistadors obliterated the royal family. Thus, Pachacuti's reform is seldom known. Think about that. Looking out at the world, that can't be God. God has to be greater than that. He's got to be the true one. We can't split worship. And he led a religious reform. This is the Incas in South America. Uh, he was one of the ones who built Machu Picchu. Okay, That's what we're talking about here. And he was leading his whole nation into monotheism, the omnipotent creator, all-powerful creator. Second example, the Santal in India, Calcutta. After missionaries gave the gospel to these people, a number of sages exclaimed, what this stranger is saying must mean that the genuine God has not forgotten us after all this time. In other words, the missionaries talked about the true God, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, and they said, we know about that God. There is a genuine God. Thakur Ju, that's what they called him, but it translated means the real God. According to the Santal, the genuine God created the first man and woman, but they were enticed by a demonic figure to deny the genuine God by making an offering to Satan that is so ubiquitous or pervasive in world religion, in animism. You always pay off the small deities because you're scared of them. After they denied the genuine God in their history, they realized that they were naked and ashamed. The genuine God flooded the entire earth, rescuing a holy pair of people. After the flood, the genuine God scattered the people into many nations. The Santal exclaimed or claimed, quote, After finding other gods day by day, we forgot the genuine God more and more until only his name remained. It is said by some that the Son God is the genuine God. Uh-uh. But the fathers taught us that the genuine God, not the Son God, is distinct. He is not to be seen with fleshly eyes, but he sees all. Omnipresent. Uh, omniscient. 
He has created all things omnipotent. He has set everything in its place, sovereign, and nourishes all, great and small, loving. Finally, the Gedeo in Ethiopia. So we've been to India, we've been to South America, now Africa. These people believed in Magano, the omnipotent creator. Even though they believed in Magano, the Gedeo offered sacrifices to an evil spirit named Satan. Sorry, Shaitan, that's what they called him. When they were asked why they did this, the Gedeo replied, we sacrifice to Shaitan not because we love him, but because we simply do not enjoy close enough ties with Mangano to allow us to be done with Shaitan. We want to get in with the true God, but we, there's a barrier. We can't get in with him. If we could only get in with the true God, we could, we could like cast out, we could get rid of Shaitan. We'd have nothing to do with him ever again, but we just can't get to the real one. One man in the group pursued a personal response from Mangano, the true God, by praying that God would reveal himself to the Gideo people. Almost immediately, the man claimed to receive visions of two white men erecting flimsy shelters under a large sycamore tree near his hometown in Dila. During the vision, the man heard a voice that said to him, quote, These men will bring you a message from Mangano, the God you seek. Wait for them. Eight years passed. In December of 1948, two Canadian missionaries arrived at Dila after they had been refused permission to go to the center of the Gadeo population. Dila was farther away. Seeking the shade from the heat, the two men rested under a large sycamore tree. The Gadeo visionary walked up just as the two men were unpacking their flimsy tents. Within three decades, the Gadeo man and two missionaries planted 200 churches, each housing 200 people. Was that 40,000 people? All through, well, through realizing this can't be real. These, these religions that we're worshiping, birds, reptiles, mortal men, that can't be real. There's got to be a true God. So Richardson concludes, incredible as it seems, literally thousands of Christian missionaries down throughout history have been startled by exuberant welcome, even among some of Earth's most remote people. So God has revealed himself enough to humanity. Three, the third proposition, God will reveal himself extra to those who seek him. He hasn't revealed himself equally, but I don't think that's feasible. But he has revealed himself enough, and he will re reveal himself extra to those who seek him. God gives more revelation to those who seek him. Remember I said the part you might not agree with me with? The part about, you know, well, you need to hear Jesus' name. You could take my view, get rid of that part, and just skip to this part right here. That if anybody is seeking God, they'll find him through a vision, a dream, an angel, a missionary. If you're seeking God, you will find him. What did Jesus say? Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. So we see this repeatedly. Cornelius, a lover of God. What happens? He gets a vision. Peter shows up. In the Old Testament, we just have passage after passage. If you seek God, you will find him. So anyone at the end of history, when they stand before Christ, if they say, well, I just wasn't born in the right place, or I didn't hear enough, or I never heard Jesus' name, God will be, rightly be able to say, you didn't seek me. I revealed myself in creation and conscience, and you didn't want me. Oh man, this book by Tom Doyle, Dreams and Visions. He's a missionary. These, these stories seem too good to be true. But he has a lot of credibility. For one, He's from Dallas Theological Seminary, which is a cessationist seminary. They don't believe in the charismatic gifts. Highly conservative, very into the Bible. This kind of stuff, I'm not saying they would not agree with. I'm just saying this is not something you would expect to come out of DTS. That's all I'm going to say. Okay? This didn't come out of a Pentecostal uh, setting. Tom Doyle also affirms that people that he talked to never came to Christ through dreams and visions. Not one. A dream or a vision led them to a Christian who led them to faith. All right, let's think of some examples. Uh, first, Doyle says, more Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus today than ever before. 
fact, we believe more Muslims have become followers of Jesus in the last 10 years than the last 14 centuries of Islam combined. He gives the example of an Egyptian woman named Noor. She picked a missionary out of the crowd after having a dream about Jesus. And she went right up to the missionary and said, you, you're the one. Yes, you, you, with the glasses, the shirt. Yeah, you were in my dream. Jesus walked with me alongside a lake and he told me how much he loves me, she told the man. That love, I felt it in my dream. His love was different than anything I've ever experienced. I've never felt so much peace in my heart. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want him to leave. I asked this Jesus, why are you visiting me, a poor Muslim mother with eight children? And all he said was, I love you, Nor. I have given everything for you. I died for you. Ask my friend tomorrow about me. No longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. John 15. He will tell you all you need to know in order to understand why I visited you. Jesus did not tell me your name, she said, but you are wearing the same clothes you have on right now and had the same glasses. They're the same too. In my dream, your face radiated in a way that told me Jesus was indeed your friend. So she saw him in the dream and Jesus went, that guy's with me, talk to him. Another example, the secret police, a man named Muhammad. He was telling a missionary, or excuse me, tailing a missionary, but as he was tailing this missionary thinking he shouldn't be in our country, he kept getting dreams about Jesus. The dream that bothered him the most was when Jesus asked him, Muhammad, Muhammad, why are you persecuting me? When he got to that part of the story, he locked me in the eye and he claimed, Adele, I am not persecuting Jesus. I'm just doing my job. He was really troubled by what Jesus had said. I asked, Muhammad, where were you when you had this dream? In my hotel room in Damascus. I told him that I know of someone else who had the same dream, and he was on his way to Damascus. It was a vision, actually. Did this take place recently? Muhammad asked me. <laughs> Muhammad is now one of us. He is a secret follower of Jesus in the secret police in his country. This book, you would do yourself a favor to read it. Story after story after story. This gets you to pray big for people. People who are seeking God, God finds them. Now let's look at a few problems with my view. Okay, equal, enough, extra. Why did God choose to use human agency at all? That ever bother you? Why would he use me? Why would he use you? I get so tongue-tied sometimes, you know, I can't even get the words out. I don't know what to say. I. I get gummed up, I come off too strong, I come off too soft, I, I'm a coward, I, I don't speak up when I should. Why would he use me? Why would he use you? Well, I got it all figured out in these next three points. We'll explain this whole mystery perfectly. I'll do my best. Number one, number one. Philosophically, God might have chosen self-limitation or divine rules. You say, wait a minute, you're saying God is enacting, according to his plan, rules that he can't break? That's what I'm saying, yes. I'm saying divine rules. God agrees to certain rules, rules of engagement. When it comes to spiritual warfare, for example, God has agreed not to just completely incinerate and blow away Satan. Why? Why did he agree? Why? Why would he do that? Satan apparently can kill people, according to the Bible, but he isn't permitted to. Otherwise, right when he saw the Apostle Paul, he would have had Paul killed or give him some sickness or something. I don't know what. Same thing is true here. I believe that God could adhere to certain divine rules, not rules that are above God. That's, that's heresy. These are rules that are below God. It's kind of like when God gives us free will. God gives us free will but this isn't something that's above God, as though God couldn't revoke free will if he desired. God works through gravity, but he could 
do a miracle and revoke gravity if he felt like it. He could do whatever he wants. This could be a self-limitation from God in the same way that he limited himself when he purchased salvation. He limits himself in spreading salvation. Did he limit himself when he took up the cross? Yes, he did. He worked through a certain plan, through a certain people, to bring about the Jewish Messiah so there'd be prophecy. And then the ultimate self-limitation was the incarnation. This is not a foreign idea. Very plausible. So he did all that to get to the cross. So what brought about purchasing our salvation could also be the explanation for spreading our salvation. Now you say, well, what possible reason would he have? Here's my thought. He's doing something through us, through Christians throughout the world, that's going to have an eternal ramification. That we are going to be trophies of his grace for eternity. I better stop there. All I'm going to say is, at the very least, the angels will be able to look at us and say, what was it like living in a world that was fallen, filled with brokenness and sickness and death, you know, we are going to be a testament to that forever. And God is doing something through the church at large that, that we can't see. He definitely does this in Job 1 and 2. He has divine rules. You know, you can go and attack him, but you can't take his life. You can do this, but you can't do that. So God agrees to operate in a certain way. Again, let me reiterate, these rules are not above God. They're below him. He's agreeing to do this. Why? For some justification that we don't know. Second, personally, God speaks actually very powerfully through broken people. You know, when I'm at work, uh, when you're at work, a friend comes up to you and explains the new policy for the company. I would much rather hear it from my friend than from my boss. Because when the boss says it, it just has a certain authority, a certain chutzpah to it that I just feel like, mm, you know, I guess I can't disagree with this. But when it's my friend, I'm a little bit more open to what the person has to say. Now, if God spoke to all of us through an angel, what do you think our reaction would be? We don't have to wonder. Daniel 10, when he's standing there in front of the angel, he was paralyzed, shot right to the ground. Uh, Zechariah, Luke 1, when he's in the temple, he sees the angel, he can't move, he's sh shot up with fear. Mary, what's the first words out of Gabriel's mouth? Do not be afraid. Seeing an angel, a spiritual being, would be so overwhelming, you couldn't even handle it. But seeing another sinful, broken person like you, sharing the gospel with you, might actually be, uh, how do I put it, kind of like, you know, putting breadcrumbs in your hand and kind of putting out in front of the pigeons. But if you move too quickly, it could totally scare them away. But if you do it slow enough, they kind of trust you. So working through a person like us, this actually could be a very powerful way for God to spread his message of love and forgiveness. Third, when we think about this great commission, it is indeed a great commission, we feel like, I don't want that responsibility. Why did, why did he choose me? Why do I have to do this? Okay, that's one perspective. But there's another perspective, which is that this is an incredibly high calling. What could be a higher calling than this? There is none. There is no greater calling than spreading a message of love and forgiveness that could bring people from this world to the next, that could bring people from hell into heaven. There is no greater purpose with which we could be endowed by our Creator. And that's exactly what we see here. God could also get greater glory by using broken people like us. You guys ever watch that show MacGyver? I don't mean the new one. I don't bother with that. I mean the old one with uh, Richard Dean something. The old one. I used to watch that as a kid with my dad. Uh, that, movie, that show was great. Anyways, every episode, MacGyver would get caught you know, in handcuffs by the Nazis or the Soviets or whoever. Who, who cares? The bad guys would get MacGyver. And you'd be like, man, they got MacGyver this time. <laughs> they got him. There's no way he's getting out. And he would have like a couple of things in his pocket. It would be like a toothpick and like, you know, a gauze and a match and dental floss. And so, you know, and then he put all those things together and he wrap it around and then he would create like a bomb out of that. 
And then he would take that and escape and he'd kill all the bad. And that was every episode. MacGyver was doing that. I thought, man, I want to be like MacGyver when I get older, you know? Well, why was that show so uh, scintillating to such a, a young kid? It was, it was very cool because he would take the worst possible things, you know, like a toothpick and gauze and a match, and he would do the greatest possible thing with it. You know, defeat the bad guys. Get out. Now, if MacGyver had a gun and a grenade and, you know, SEAL Team 6 behind him, it wouldn't have been a fun show because when you have really good things working in your favor. Now, what if God could use the worst possible means to perform the greatest possible outcome? That would speak about Him for eternity. All right. Let me close with this, on this section at least. It's a mystery why God uses human agency. I don't know why. I honestly don't. But it's not a mystery that he uses it. That is crystal clear. We could totally, you know, philosophize about this, but at the end of the day, we don't want our, our speculations to override revelation. Right? God says it right here and right there and right there. But I'm going to speculate and override what he plainly says? No, that's a totally false methodology. What about this question? Do people need to hear Jesus' name to receive forgiveness? Let me give you some examples here. In the Old Testament, how many people heard Jesus' name? Old Testament era, I should say. Zero. Maybe you could make a case. Maybe Zechariah 3 and Zechariah 6. Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest who's a type of Christ. Maybe. But, but Moses, David, They never heard Jesus' name, and yet you read Romans 4, what did David find? What did he find? Citing Psalm 32, that his his lawless deeds were forgiven. What did Abraham find? Genesis 15, 6, uh, the righteous shall live by faith, or that's Habakkuk 2, 4. Um, God credited, uh, Abraham had faith, and God credited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham is going to heaven, Yes, Moses, going to heaven, he shows up at the Mount of Transfiguration. He's there. Elijah's there. He's there, Mount of Transfiguration. David's going to heaven. Psalm 32, Psalm 51, Romans 4. Hebrews 11, they all found it. All those people, I mean, even some of them that were kind of like, should that have made the list? You know, like Samson, should he really be on there? You know, Uh, Jephthah, should he be there? He, he, all these Old Testament believers are going to heaven. Did they ever hear the name of Jesus? No, they never did. So what's that mean? That means, according to the Bible, you can go to heaven without hearing Jesus' name if you have saving faith. What about infants? I am a big proponent of infant salvation. If you have a baby that dies, that baby goes straight to heaven. Infant salvation, though, is, is true. It's true. David said when he was weeping over his son, 2 Samuel 12, I will go to the boy, but he will not come back to me. So what does that mean? David goes to heaven. That means he must be meeting his infant boy in heaven. Same thing is true when we read through Psalm 16. He's in heaven. Romans 4, he's in heaven. Isaiah 7, 16 says, there is a time before the child knows to choose the good and not the evil. Deuteronomy 1, same thing. Uh, there's a good, very, very good case that infants go to heaven. Did infants ever hear about Jesus' sacrifice? I mean, mine did. I whispered it in their ears, you know. You know Jesus loves you. He loves you, you know. They, they didn't get it. They didn't know. They don't remember it. But I, I did. I tried, you know. But did they ever hear it and believe it? No, they didn't hear or believe it. But would they go to heaven anyways, even though they didn't hear it? Yes, they would. The thorn in my side, in my view, is Romans 10, 14. How will they believe unless they hear? How will they hear unless somebody preaches to them? What do you do with that passage? Honestly, this is a tough passage for my view. It just is. It really is. Now, uh, Acts 4, 12, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's not difficult for my view because name in Hebrew thinking is the person. 
uh, the individual. It's not that you have to say the name or know the name. That's not the important part. We can say Jesus or Yeshua or Jesus or whatever. The name isn't important. It's the person, the referent. So saying it in their name, I'm coming in in the name of the law. It's the authority of Jesus, right? But here, how will they hear without a preacher? And how can they believe without hearing? That's difficult. My best explanation here would be that in the context of Romans 10, is Paul referring to the unreached in the middle of Ethiopia who have never heard the gospel? No. In Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul is talking about the Jews who have heard the gospel. So the context is not about people that haven't heard the message of Christ. In fact, he cites that, that, that passage in uh, Psalm 19 saying they have heard. They do know God. They have. It's, it's, this line has gone out into the entire world. So I find it difficult to say definitively that this is a passage that's saying that you need to hear Jesus' name. In the context, that's not, that's not what we're seeing. It could mean that it's the normative way that you come to Christ, that you get forgiveness. Is how, how Paul's asking, like any one of us would do, how can you believe without hearing? And how can you hear without somebody preaching? How can he do that? I don't know if he's saying necessarily it's impossible. I think he's just saying this is, this is the way it happens. And may I add, I think if Paul had gone on further and said, yeah, but there's other ways they could learn, we would just totally excuse ourselves from this great, incredible calling that we have. But let's say you're like, I don't buy it. I think Romans 10, 14, you got to hear Jesus' name. What I would say is, I don't think it's that materially different for you to say, well, you can't come to faith through general revelation, but general revelation can get you to the point where you will seek God, and if you seek God, he will find you through a vision, a dream, an angel, a missionary. And, and for somebody to say, well, I don't think God would do that. How do you know that? How do you know God wouldn't respond to that? Of course he would. All right, if your view is true, James, then why are there missionaries? Okay, for one, because we're commanded to go into all nations. That's why. My view is speculation. My view is not revelation. I could be wrong. In fact, that's why I'm giving you some fallback positions. I could be wrong about this. But I know what's commanded in Scripture is that uh, we should go into all the nations. We could, should spread the gospel to all people. And that is our role. So I want to start with that rather than my speculations of maybe there's somebody out there that could come to saving faith apart from hearing Jesus' name. You know, if I was for some reason, called in to defuse a bomb. And I had the wire cutters. And the, you know, the bomb squad was in my ear. And he said, James, you got 15 seconds before this whole building blows up. Cut the red wire. I wouldn't be saying, now, are there any other possible ways that we could defuse this bomb that wouldn't involve the normative way of cutting the red wire? Like, are there other ways that maybe we could cut the... I would just snip the wire and we could talk about that later, right? For me, my attitude toward this is go and reach all nations, spread the gospel to all people. And maybe when we get to heaven, we're going to find that there's people that never heard Jesus' name. And then I'll be right and the other guys will be wrong. And I'll be like, praise God. And if I'm wrong, I'll be like, well, I did as best as I could anyways. It doesn't matter. I would admit, if this is true, my view is true, very few people come to saving faith this way. I don't really agree with Richardson that this is happening all the time where missionaries, they go into a village and, oh yeah, we already believe in the one true God here. I don't believe that. Why is it that in Africa in 1900, there was, I don't know, 4 million Christians. Today, there's 516 million Christians in Africa. Why is that? Does it have anything to do with the modern missions movement? Yes. And even if this was true, like even if it's true that somebody could come to forgiveness and saving faith through general revelation, why does that mean that we should abdicate ourselves of all responsibility? Like if there was a lighthouse that gave sufficient light to get a boat onto shore, and there's a boat coming in, and he could hit the rocks, this could be all over. Well, there's sufficient light for him to see. Okay, it might be sufficient but why wouldn't we get guys down by the dock with more lights and flares and doing everything we could to get them in safely? Here's what I would say. This is the best I can do, actually. Uh, 
This is the best Peter Kraft could do. He's a philosopher at Boston University. He came up with this illustration. I thought it was pretty good. He said, uh, if you thought that someone might die, would you move any slower than if you thought that they would die? Someone's joking. You need to give them the Heimlich. Well, they might die. Eh, I should guess I'll just kind of take my time and go around. Or they will die. I know they will die. So I should go around and go. No, you would move just as fast whether they might die versus if they will die. Give you an illustration here. Uh, here's my son. We discovered that he had a uh, cashew allergy. Here's how he normally looks after just taking a little cashew treat. That's what his face looked like. All puffed up. He couldn't breathe. He was wheezing. Um, I had jumped up, grabbed him, grabbed the keys, got into the van. It was right during rush hour. And I was going about 100 miles, I mean, not, not exaggerating, 100 miles an hour. I was in our old minivan. I was holding back, holding his hand to kind of keep him calm. And I was weaving between traffic, getting down to Nationwide to get in there. And we got in there, and I saw the guy behind the counter. You know, Hi, how are you? How are you doing, little buddy? And I was just like, he's having shock. He's allergy. He can't breathe. Can you expedite this as fast as possible? And the guy was like, okay, sure. You know, we got him right back there. Here's him on the uh, crash cart. They got all the doctors and everything all around him. Now, no, no, why am I sharing all this? When he was having those symptoms, couldn't breathe, I didn't know if he was going to die. I honestly didn't. I still don't know. If I'd gone slower, would he have died? I'm not trying to be dramatic. I just don't know. Little kids, that's the way that they die is breathing. They can't breathe. Now, he might have died, or maybe he might not have, or maybe he might have died, or he definitely would have. Did I drive any slower on the highway? No. If I knew that he was going to die, I would have driven 100 miles an hour. If I thought he might die, I would have driven 100 miles an hour. If a person out in the middle of nowhere might come to Christ through general revelation, I'm going to drive 100 miles an hour out there to reach that person. And if that person won't come to Christ without hearing the name of Jesus, we should drive 100 miles an hour out there to reach him. So that's why we have missionaries. Clear communication, if we were to summarize all this, what about those who have never heard the gospel? What do you say about that? Okay, hold on. Not all views can be true. That's not bigotry. That's not intolerance. That's math. They, they can't all be true. Some religions say that God is impersonal. Some say he's personal. Some say he's 330 million gods. Some say there's one God. Some say there's an afterlife. Some say you, you die at the grave. Some say it's a personal afterlife. Some say that you become one with the all. They can't all be true. They all have mutually exclusive claims. So either one is true or none are true. So if that's the case, not only do I believe Christianity is true, but I hope it's true. Do you see the distinction? I not only think there's good reasons to be a Christian, but I, I'm, I hope this is the one that's true because this is the message that has reached more people on planet Earth than any other message. More people have heard the name Jesus. More people have encountered Christianity. More people have become Christians than any other worldview. Finally, when people say, I can't come to Christ because what about the person out in the middle of nowhere who's never heard of it? How's that fair? Okay, my answer is God is going to take care of that person. God is going to reach that person if they seek him. God has spoken through creation and conscience. God will reach anyone who seeks him. But I hope you realize that by making that objection, you're showing that revelation is not the problem. Because you're saying, well, if everyone heard enough revelation, if everyone had equal revelation, you're hearing the revelation right now. You're hearing it coming out of my mouth. You're reading it in the Bible. You've seen the evidence yourself. By saying, I won't receive Christ and come to Christ because of that person out there, that person out there doesn't have the objection. You do, but you're the one with the information. So they're not complaining, but you are, even though you're the one whom God has graciously given the revelation. But my question to them would be, what about you? If I could tell you God is going to take care of that person, 
I want to ask, what are you going to do in response to what God says?